My name is, is Ed McGinn, and I'm a professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the University of Notre Dame. I'm also the department chair. Um, I live in South Bend, Indiana, but I um, grew up in Des Moines, Iowa, which is about 400 miles west of here. I originally went to grade school and in, 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 uh, high school in Des Moines and then eventually decided to go to Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa, which is kind of the big engineering state school in Iowa. And uh, I thought I wanted to study engineering. I really liked math and science in high school and um, thought that engineering would be kind of a good fit where I could use some of those math and science skills, but also kind of in a practical way as well. So I decided to major in chemical engineering when I went to Iowa State. So I decided I wanted to be an engineer, I think, around my junior year of high school. So um, my favorite classes were English, chemistry, physics, and math. Um, so I had these great teachers, especially my chemistry and physics teacher. I remember them very well, and they, they really kind of stimulated my love for kind of learning and understanding. And then I had a, a friend whose brother was a chemical engineer, and he seemed to be kind of a cool guy, and I thought, well, that sounds pretty interesting. Um, so I thought at that time maybe I should think about being an engineer um, because I was also interested in more practical things and being able to apply my knowledge to, to problem solving. So I think that was kind of the first time I thought I might want to be an engineer and so I went ahead and took the plunge and decided to major in chemical engineering right away as a freshman. So the, the thing I guess that really drew me to engineering was this sort of idea that you could, um, that you could apply fundamental knowledge. So scientific knowledge, things that, that we learn in chemistry and physics, but you could apply it to, to real problems. And um, I think right away when I took my first chemical engineering class, it's this basic introductory class, I was, I was really good at it and I liked it and it was really fun. And then I took thermodynamics, which was kind of the next course, and I was completely hooked. I thought that was just the most interesting topic ever. And I teach thermodynamics now, so it's, it's interesting that you kind of find your passion at a young age, and, um, and that's kind of the area that I work in uh, now. So I think it was kind of a straightforward thing for me. I didn't have a lot of wavering. I majored in chemical engineering, and I went straight into it. And that's unusual. I think a lot of times people change majors, are not exactly sure. But I was pretty sure from an early age that this is what I really wanted to do, and it kind of worked out that way. I mean, I really chose my discipline, I think, because of my interest in chemistry. I would say it was primarily the thing that, that did it for me. Um, and again, it was, it was my high school teachers, I think, that really kind of instilled this sort of passion in me. Um, and then I, I did um, various research as, a, as an undergraduate and internships and kind of got to see what the bigger picture of, of chemical engineering was. And I thought it was a really great field that, where you can really apply kind of chemical thinking with, with engineering thinking and, and uh, do problem solving. So that was, that was really what kind of drew me to that particular major. My junior year in college, I started thinking maybe I'd like to get into academia. I thought being a professor looks like kind of a cool job. And I really admired my, my professors. I thought that they were very interesting people. Um, I, I admired the graduate students I saw. I started doing undergraduate research. And um, the graduate students were, were just so into their work and they were, they were, were so hard working. And I, I was really kind of fascinated by how somebody could just put five years of their life into really kind of working on one problem. And, um, but I didn't really understand. It was, seemed like it was way over my head. So I was trying to do this research with them and they were way far ahead of me. And I thought, well, that's, that's pretty neat. I wonder if I could ever do that. But then I, I, about my junior year, I got an internship with Procter & Gamble. And I was working making shampoo and toothpaste um, at, a, at a Procter & Gamble plant. And I liked that too, that was fun. Um, I got to use some of my, my engineering background to, to help them 
solve some of the problems that they had. And after my internship, they gave me a job offer, a permanent job offer. So going into my senior year, I had a guaranteed job with a good company. It was pretty good pay. And uh, my parents thought, well, now, you know, Ed's set. He's finally got a job. So they were kind of relieved, I think. And um, then I had a decision to make. Do I really want to try to go into academia, or should I, should I go take a job? And um, it, was a, it was a struggle, but I ended up taking the job. I ended up working for Procter & Gamble. And about that time, I got engaged. And um, my future wife got into law school, and it turned out that where she could go to law school and where I was going to work was exactly the same place. So it seemed like everything kind of fit together. So I started working for Procter & Gamble. And um, that was a great job. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it, was, it, was, um, it was rewarding. It was a lot of fun. But probably after the first year, I realized uh, I think I really want to be an academic. So um, I started tutoring kids chemistry and math. And I found that this nighttime tutoring was way more fun than my day job. And I kind of realized then my calling was really to go into teaching. Um, but then I had this problem that I had, my wife was in law school, and so what would I do? So I stayed for three years until she graduated from law school, and then I quit. And I moved to California and went into to graduate school at the University of California at Berkeley. And um, that changed a lot of things. So it was a big shock moving from the Midwest uh, out to the West Coast. Um, but then uh, graduate school went well, five years, six years of in-depth research. And then uh, I came to Notre Dame, and I've been here ever since as a faculty member at Notre Dame. Yeah, so my research in graduate school is kind of in the same area that I work in now. So we use um, computers, very large-scale computational simulations, to study the properties of matter at the atomic level. And the idea is if we could understand how atoms interact at the atomic level and make predictions then about what their macroscopic properties are. We could figure out how to design new materials with just the right properties that we want to have um, favorable properties. And we work on problems involving energy and the environment. So we do work with energy storage. Can we develop better batteries, better electrolytes? Um, we've done a lot of work on developing solvents for carbon capture and sequestration. Um, and just making separations less energy intensive. So you, in graduate school, I worked on um, problems of adsorption into nanoporous materials. And we still do a little bit of that work um, today. So the goal is really to try to use big scale computations, combining it with statistical, mechanical properties, and thermodynamics um, so that we can design new materials. I spend about a th maybe 25 or 30 percent of my time doing research and mentoring graduate students and postdocs and al also some undergraduate researchers. Um, I teach, and so I spend a good bit of time doing that. But probably maybe half of my time right now is spent being the department chair, which means I have kind of overall responsibility for overseeing the operation of the department, making sure everything runs and, and all the details are worked out. So there's a lot of um, kind of administrative responsibilities associated with that. So it's a pretty varied job. I get to do research, I get to teach students, and I get to do bureaucracy. Sure, I grew up in a, in a pretty typical Catholic uh, family, so I was raised Catholic. Went to Catholic grade school and Catholic high school. Um, and it was just sort of part of my identity. Um, the town I grew up in, kind of a Midwestern town, it was sort of a normal, everyone around you at your Catholic school was all Catholic, and we didn't really think about it very much. I kind of just assumed that everybody was Catholic or Irish or German or something like that. Um, and then going to college, still in a Midwestern town, um, things kind of just were kind of the same. Uh, I was active in the Newman Center at Iowa State, and it was nice to see a lot of my friends and, and some of the faculty I had in class were, were participants in that. And so it was an important part of my life. Um, when I then worked after college, um, my wife and I joined a parish 
that was also kind of affiliated with the university. So things were kind of the same. It was uh, in the Midwestern town, a lot of young people, a lot of college kids, and we sort of continued on along that way. We got married in that church. It was a great experience. But that was sort of um, all the way through my first 23 years of my life or so. It was kind of like um, an integral part where it was sort of the air you breathe. It was kind of natural. And then I moved to California. And I realized that being a practicing Catholic puts you in a very big minority, actually. Uh, it was strange to me. Even being a Christian, <clears throat> it was not kind of the typical thing at the campus I was at. And I ran into lots of people of all different faiths and no faiths. And it was, a, it was kind of a very different experience for me. Um, we joined a, a little parish that had lots of immigrant families, lots of older people, younger people from all over the world. And I realized there the Catholic Church really is a universal church. So that was kind of an eye-opening experience for me to, to see people from Honduras and from Costa Rica and from Vietnam who all kind of came together in this parish, but we all had kind of the same faith life. Different cultures, different backgrounds, but there was this sort of unifying uh, message of the church. And that was a pretty powerful, powerful thing for me to see. Um, and then uh, coming to Notre Dame, where it's sort of magnified, where you see people from all over the world here now coming to this Catholic institution, um, made, a big, made a big impact on me. And I think um, for me, being around very smart people, um, faculty from all different backgrounds and disciplines, who think very seriously about this 2,000-year-old intellectual tradition of, of the Catholic Church, and how do you put... The, the teachings of the church and make that part of what you do as a profession and integrate that and seeing people put that into practice and seeing our students put this into practice, it's really strengthened, I'd say, my faith life, just being present on this campus. It's really unlike any other school, I think, in the, in the country that does that, that can put the sort of faith and reason together and it makes, it makes a lot of sense. It's interesting to think about <clears throat> um, your faith life and being an engineer. Um, I think there's a lot of people who think faith and reason are incompatible. And one of the things that I uh, think Notre Dame stands for is really showing the compatibility of faith and reason. Um, a lot of parents and sometimes students will ask me, what's the difference between science and engineering? It's people kind of think it's the same thing, and, and they're not. Um, Scientists are trying to understand the way the world is. They're trying to ask the question, how is the world? What, what, is, what is here? What is the reality around us? Engineers ask a little bit of a different question. They say, okay, given the way the world is, what could I do? How could I create within the world to make a product or to make someone's lives better or to make something? So engineers are asking a little bit of a different question, which is, what should I do? What should I do with this knowledge? In other words, they're asking, what ought I to do? And really, no place in the, <clears throat> in the physical world does anyone answer the question of what you ought to do. That's a choice that we have to make. And for me, my faith really kind of answers that question of what ought I to do. And I think the Catholic tradition has really some good answers for what you ought to do. You ought to be thinking about the dignity of the human being, everyone. You ought to be thinking about care for the poor. You ought to be thinking about the dignity of work and that what people do matters. You ought to be thinking about uh, solidarity with those who are suffering. You ought to be thinking about subsidiarity. So all those ought kind of questions, for me, answers the questions of what should I be working on? And I want to work on problems that really kind of address those fundamental questions. It can't be about, I want to make the most money. I can't be telling my students, you should go out and be an engineer because you can get rich and make a lot of money and uh, have a happy life. That would be great. I mean, we won't deny that people want to have a comfortable life. But I hope that my students also learn a little bit more about what should you do to sort of make this a better place. And engineers have a, a unique way of doing that. If you think about 
uh, all of the changes that have happened in the last hundred years in our society, they've really all been driven by technology. I mean, nothing is changing the world more than technology. And engineers are the people who make that technology. And so the question then asks, we have to ask ourselves is, well, what should we do as engineers? How should we change society? And I hope that we change society for the better and, and try to address some of these pressing questions that we have facing us. We just finished a big project where we were trying to develop some new types of materials that you could use to capture carbon dioxide from combustion sources. So we still generate almost all of our primary energy from fossil fuels and probably that's going to be true for some time into the future. So one of the hopes that people had is if, if we could somehow capture the carbon dioxide before it went into the atmosphere. Um, could we do that and try to ameliorate, uh, ameliorate some of the problems associated with greenhouse gas emissions? So we've developed some materials that <clears throat> allow you to do that um, more efficiently than existing materials. Unfortunately, it still takes a lot of energy and it's very costly. And um, one of the sad things is that the markets kind of dictate what technology comes online. And so even if you can develop really great technology, if um, the alternative is cheaper, which the alternative is to just release the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. There is no real market that allows you to do that. But we've developed some technology that hopefully if market signals change and some regulations get passed, maybe those uh, technologies will work. Um, the other thing that we're working on, again, are developing um, enhanced electrolytes that can make batteries more efficient. And I think if you can, if you can do that, if we can store energy more efficiently, then a lot of renewable energy like solar and wind now becomes much more economically viable. And uh, we're seeing this now. A lot of battery technology um, is being developed. And so we, we hope that some of the things that we've been working on will lead to, to further advances in battery technology. So uh, engineers who want to sort of practice their faith and, and live the life of faith I think it's, it's pretty easy to do that. Um, being an engineer is a vocation. It's just like any other kind of vocation that you could think about. And you can really solve a lot of the pressing problems in the world. So you can make a direct impact on sustainability, on clean water, on access to food, on uh, really peace. If you think about <clears throat> a lot of the conflicts that are going on in the world, it's arguments over resources, uh, making sure that people have enough food to eat, that they're secure and that they're safe in their homes and things like that. And technology plays a huge role in making, uh, really solving all of those kinds of problems. And so I think uh, an engineer who, who wants to practice their faith, it's, it's, it's a very easy thing to do. You pick some problems that you're passionate about that you think really matter and you go work on them. And uh, there's no shortage of problems facing us in the 21st century and I think engineers are going to play a, a major role in making sure that we can come up with, with solutions to those problems. Yeah. So one thing that uh, a lot of students, I think, struggle with is that engineering is hard. It's a tough discipline. It's a tough major. Um, there's a lot of math. There's a lot of science. But then there's also all the engineering on top of that. And a lot of students, I think, are a little bit afraid to, to major in engineering. They think, well, uh, can I do it? And um, it's not for everybody, but certainly I think um, it's maybe not as daunting as people think it is. Um, and the other thing is, in college sometimes um, you'll see your friends who maybe don't have to work quite as hard as, as you do in engineering, and that can be very challenging, I think, for some students. But I think if you keep your eye on the prize and you realize that anything worth doing is going to involve a lot of work, um, and if you stick with it, getting a degree in engineering is, is one of the best things that you can do. Um, even if you don't practice in engineering, a lot of our engineers go off and um, maybe take jobs in management, maybe they do policy. Um, they don't have to work as an engineer, but having that background, having that understanding of the way the world works, I think really serves you very, very well and helps you make good decisions in the, in the future. 
And so um, it's a great profession. It pre prepares you to do almost anything that you want to do in the future. So the first you know, college chemistry course, the first physics course, those can be very challenging. Um, I think kind of realizing if you're going to be an engineer that, that there's other courses beyond that. And I think once you get into your engineering courses, um, it gets a little easier in some sense. The courses aren't easier, but you might think that they're a little bit more enjoyable, especially if you have sort of a practical mindset that you'll start to see where all the stuff comes, comes into play. Uh, but unfortunately, you have to kind of go through the base and, and, and build the, the skill set before you can kind of take the fun courses. So we call them sort of vegetables. So you have to eat your vegetables before you get to eat your dessert. And uh, so some of those courses are tough. Um, in my experience as a professor, I find that students don't come and ask for help as much as they should. They don't come to office hours as much as they should. Um, Students who are struggling typically are the ones who I don't see in my office hours. I see the A students in my office hours who are coming and asking me for help. So if I had to give anyone who is starting in college advice, it's take advantage of your professor. Go see them in office hours. Ask for help. Um, they want to see you there and talk to the teaching assistants. And don't just kind of struggle and, and, and think that um, everyone else gets it and I'm the only one who doesn't get it because probably they don't get it either. So use your resources and, and don't be afraid to do that, I think. It'd be a good piece of advice for people. Yeah, I, I loved Laudato Si. I mean, it was a great, um, a great message, I think, to, to have come from the Pope. And I actually sat on a panel uh, at the Kellogg Institute here on campus and, and we, we talked about this. It was a flash panel right after it came out so I had to quickly read, read this and, and try to have some commentary on it. And um, it's, it's a, it was a real, I think, challenge for us to say, look, these are the things that, um, that we have to address. The environment is, is crucial. We can't keep exploiting the environment. And that it's a very Catholic uh, message that uh, creation was here entrusted to us by God and we can't mess it up and it's not right for us to do that. We don't have the right to do that and uh, there has to be accountability for this and I was just, a, I thought it was very refreshing to see that and um, I think it kind of gave a lot of us who try to work in environmental problems, um, we, we were kind of cheered up by this to, to know that we have someone as influential as Pope Francis in, in, in their corner.